This podcast is part two of two on the subject of super recognition. It follows up on an article published in the spring 2020 issue of the HDI Act Journal titled Capitalizing on the Super Recognition Advantage, a powerful but underutilized tool for policing and national security agencies. The HDI Journal can be found at our website, www.hdiac.org. And David, what is it about the task of facial recognition that a human super recognizer is able to do effectively that automation or artificial intelligence maybe cannot perform as well? Well, it's a a really good question, Dirk. And I think that automated facial recognition systems, their use in um, public spaces uh, and in general, has maybe gotten a bit ahead of law and civil liberties in a number of different domains. So what we have um, with human recognizers, human super recognizers, are a couple of clearly identifiable benefits. So firstly, I think even in 2020, uh, we think that, you know, and and maybe there's a good reason for believing that uh, technology should cure all the issues that we face. Uh, We tend to believe as a society that automating a process tends to make it better, whether that's in manufacturing or driving, we tend to think that the machine knows best. However, for that to be the case in an identity authentication context, we would expect that algorithm to be performing at or near perfect levels of performance, regardless of the quality of the image, the age of the target or the suspect, or indeed their ethnicity. Uh, And at this moment in time, to my knowledge, such an algorithm does not exist. And it doesn't exist because machines struggle with exactly the the same type of problem that typical human recognizers struggle with. And that's within person variation in appearance. So as we know, to take for an example, a driving license, your image and your driving license could be up to 10 years old. And then during that time, you could have changed in terms of hairstyle uh, the natural aging process and so on. So one of the reasons that unfamiliar face recognition in security context is so difficult is because we as observers don't know how an unfamiliar person face varies. Machines to a large extent struggle with that issue as well. So that's the first issue that that I would take with that. The second is that, and and my colleague uh, Josh makes this point in, in his publications, is that often when we rely on automated systems that have been implemented, the final decision has to be taken by a human operator. Now, if automated system developers are saying that our system works at near perfect levels of performance, and then you pair that system with an individual who's poor or average at face recognition, that's going to reduce that benchmark level of performance quite considerably. And we have colleagues at the University of New South Wales in Australia who have shown that there's quite a significant reduction in performance of algorithms when paired with poor or typical recognizers who make the final decision. So, in essence, you can spend million you can spend you know quite a, a large degree of, of money and resources on automated systems but the key at present is to pair your best system with your best recognizer and that's a super recognizer in order to have the highest level of benchmark performance there are also some criticisms of uh, automated face recognition systems that tend to um, have a, a, a predisposed um, over selection of individuals from certain Uh, ethnicities. And in my own country here in Scotland, uh, our parliament recently um, blocked the implementation of automated systems in Scottish policing because of concerns relating to um, the over-targeting of ethnic minorities and and also civil liberties aspects in terms of recording large numbers of faces and databases of people who haven't provided consent. We don't have that problem with super recognizers. With super recognizers, you have a national security official, you have a border control official, you have a policeman who naturally excels at face recognition. That means that they are policing by consent, a traditional core value of um, policing and national security, but also that these civil 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 liberties concerns no longer count when you're dealing with a human operator. It's policing by consent, but it's making the most and maximizing the resources that you have already within your national security staff, your border control staff, or your police officers. So in those respects, automated systems do have a place, but they can only be truly effective if they're paired with our best people, which are super recognizers. We have to ensure that uh, that that happens in order to get the best levels of performance. 
And the advantage that super recognizers have in security critical situations is that they're not um, advently um, or adversely. Um, let me just say that again. They're not um, constrained by the same sort of civil liberties aspects that automated systems currently are. Could I, could I just want add one point to that as well? Um, I, I, th I think it's very important to add that in many ways, we expect as citizens, our police officers, to be able to identify criminals. That's what policing is. They, need, they should be able to identify them when there's been a crime. They should know who criminals are. So really, it's just another aspect of old fashioned good practice policing. So in the article, you state that uh, super recognizers can be a cost effective tool for agencies. What are the, some of the direct and indirect costs that you see agencies being able to achieve? So almost immediately, if, if we start with uh, computerized face recognition systems, we know they occasionally make mistakes and the rate of error varies by system. If you have a super recognizer working with that um, system, when an error occurs, the super recognizer is going to be far more likely to spot that error before there's any consequences whatsoever. So you could imagine that um, the police were doing a trawl of, uh, of, of photographs to try to identify someone who'd been caught on CCTV, let's say committing some very serious crime. And the computer makes a mistake and identifies an entirely innocent person. You can imagine the full resources of the police going to investigate that entirely innocent person uh, cost a huge amount of money to try to resolve an error. And then, of course, in the long term, if there are too many errors, confidence in policing itself and security in every domain is reduced. We need to know that accuracy is high, that the, the procedures police do use to investigate crime or to um, check at border control that somebody is the right person coming in with a passport. We want those people to be, those systems to be accurate. If people don't believe they're accurate, they're going to be less likely to help the police, help border control with their inquiries in future because it's like, well, hey, you're not going to solve the crime. Why should I bother telling you about it in the first place? So, so the benefits to society are far more than just some financial costs. They are um, a benefit in kind. And th this is one of the things that the Metropolitan Police found, that it's not just super recognizers are good at recognizing faces that they've seen before, they're also very good at ruling out that they haven't seen a face before. So they're far less likely to generate false leads and false investigations because of that. And it, if anything, they're actually overcautious sometimes, but, but that's probably me being a scientist, uh, working with them and trying to test them on really complex stimuli to just see how good they are. If I could just uh, uh, come in on a point there as well, um, Dirk, just to talk a bit more about how I see the, or how Josh and I see the, the savings to an organization like a, a national security agency or a, or a police policing, uh, a police force. So at present, it might be the case that, I mean, certainly from our own experience, there are large numbers of police forces in the UK, and there may be the, the similar aspects in, in the US in terms of NS agencies and so on that are not aware of this super recognizer research. They're not aware that there are indeed humans that can achieve this level of performance and that exist already within their staff. That's one of the key points here. Um, and, and so they've gone quite naturally to say, let's go for automated facial recognition systems. OK, and in terms of the cost, these are not cheap algorithms uh, to implement. They maybe require significant updates some, some way down the line and they require you to train operators to use them. So what we are saying in terms of the cost effectiveness of implementing super recognizers is for, for a national security agency or a police force, for every new staff member that you select, one component of that selection procedure should be facial recognition tests so that we can identify early on in that staff uh, that staff member's profile whether or not they're likely to be good at a role that requires identity authentication. Um, and for forces and agencies that can't afford automated 
facial recognition systems. That's a key and critical way to get this advantage into their processes. So one of the, the cost effective ways that this science helps is that from the selection procedure of new staff going forward, you can identify people with this resource at no real cost. These tasks can be done online. Uh, we, you know, they're, they're, we're able to, to train individuals to do them and so on. So therefore, it's a cost effective way of identifying a level of expertise in new recruits. But also within HDI uh, IAC and within national security, forces and so on, there will already be individuals who are super recognizers who they themselves may not know it, but there are individuals that at the moment could take these tasks within the existing officer corps, which could then be um, reallocated to tasks in which face identification is vital. And that's a cost effective resource because first of all, it means that individuals who are not good at this task are identified and shouldn't be in, they should be reallocated to other roles, but also within the existing staff, there are individuals that can be allocated appropriately. Again, it's just about maximizing the resources. So in terms of costs and benefits, automated recognition systems are expensive. Not everyone can use them. Those who can't, there are super recognizers within your staff or individuals at the, the top end of normal that can help. And it's a two way uh, uh, aspect. First of all, by doing that, we identify those who shouldn't be in identification roles, replacing them those with should. And going forward, for every new staff member and every training centre, we can identify this expertise early on in the process. So uh, given today's environment, uh, does the global COVID-19 pandemic present any challenges to the ability of super recognizers to perform their roles? For example, would a super recognizer have difficulty with facial identity uh, if a person is wearing a surgical mask? So, yeah, I mean, that is a very good question as well. We have done some research where, with disguises, I have to say, where we've um, one, of, one of the studies we did, we, we, we asked somebody to actually wear a balaclava. It wasn't a full balaclava, but it was, it was one that sort of was that. So you could see that part of the eyes. In another condition, he wore a hat and dark glasses. Uh, and then there was another condition as well. And then in the fourth, he wore no disguise at all. And participants in that particular study uh, had to watch a video of this, this man. And then a week later, were asked to try and identify that person from a typical identity lineup that you, you, you know the police normally hold. From the research that we, we did with balaclavas, we probably expect that face masks will reduce ability to recognize faces. However, they, we, we know that super recognizers perform far better than controls. Even when the person was wearing a balaclava, uh, a face mask doesn't cover as much of the face as a balaclava. So I still think there is a super recognizer advantage. Great. Uh, so my last question, uh, gentlemen, for you today is thinking to the future, what concerns do you have about facial recognition when it comes to policing and national security? So, so in my opinion, we, 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 in the United States and in the UK, we, we see a lot of resistance to automatic face recognition machines. A lot of people are very concerned that their privacy is in some way being invaded. Uh, I think we all have to share some of those concerns to some degree. I also think, though, that most people believe that if, for instance, there's a terrorist uh, threat in any way, that those same machines, <laughs> we need them. So there is a sort of strange dichotomy between the two. So there is a threat because if these systems, let's say, get banned by different cities, different countries like in, in Scotland for use by police. And then we have an emergency when we need them. We're going to miss that opportunity. So I'm very concerned that governments just rule the use of these systems out in future. I do think there is a place for them. Um, and I think there has to be regulation to control when those systems can be used. So that sort of hopefully will persuade some of those people who might be concerned about the privacy issues. Same thing to some extent with, with super recognizers and using these systems. But as I said before, super recognizers, they're just doing old fashioned policing well. <laughs>
<laughs> and I'd, if I could add to that, uh, Dirk, I'd just like to, to say that we have nearly 10 years now of empirical research which supports the super recognizer concept. There are multiple papers now which support the idea that super recognizers are at the top end of a distribution, but also from the wonderful work that Josh has done in real world settings with the Metropolitan Police and so on. We know not only in a lab based setting, but in a real world setting that there is a super recognizer advantage. Now, one of the concerns that I have, and that's why I enjoy doing public engagement and, and knowledge exchange activities, is to try and get that knowledge in, a, in, a, in an accessible way to police officers, to police forces, to national security agencies that can benefit from this advantage. So we've had a decade of research now, and I think from my point of view as an applied scientist, it's now important to get that advantage into society as, as far as we can do. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time today and for discussing the work uh, with us on our HDI podcast. And we certainly look forward to um, continuing our discussions, you know, potentially with uh, a future uh, meeting or conference um, in our biometrics technical focus area. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for viewing part two of the Super Recognizer podcast. This concludes the series. To learn more about our other resources and services, please reach out directly or visit us online at www.hdiac.org.